So it's helpful if uh, any of you have been going through that that podcast right now, The Bible in a Year with Father Michael Schmitz, because we've already gone through the whole of Genesis, and there's a lot of very good um, good insights through that. So I would encourage you, if you're looking for something for Lent, we're in day 45 right now, but don't worry about that. Just start there. Um, sometimes we, we can get... Um, we can lose heart if we kind of have a good intention we're going to start and then we start falling behind one of the attacks of the enemy is to say we'll just give up you know it's sometimes that happens even with like let's say we're going to mass or we're praying the rosary or different things and you know we're starting off really really good and then you know we miss a day i find this sometimes with my youth and in youth ministries they miss a day and then they kind of feel like well since i've already missed i might as well just not show up anymore and sometimes that happens, you know, even with um, um, prayer or even more like intensely like mass where it's like, well, I, 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 I failed in my promise. So therefore, uh, I better just stay home. And, and that's that's actually a, a lie from hell. That's a that's an attack from the enemy. And so if that happened to you, maybe in some of these things where it's like, well, I I fell behind maybe next year. Well, maybe the Lord is saying, just start now. Just lift up and don't worry about the past, but just start working right now. And so that's something just to think about as we get ready for Lent, um, to not let that just derail you and then you just lose the entire year and wait till next Lent. Just pick up, start from right there. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, in this book of Genesis, this story of Cain and Abel. And... There's a lot of important truths in here about the reality of sin, um, the reality of temptation, and the reality of brokenness. Because brokenness, it, it, it is very much in the midst of our free will and our choosing and that where we choose sin. But there's also this whole atmosphere, this kind of cultural soup that we can find ourselves in that also can just confuse us, influence us, and and allow the brokenness to continue. And so if you remember, even with Adam and Eve, that harmony that they had, that brokenness that entered in because of the fall, in many ways, that continues to be carried over in all the other generations. It's one of the biggest proofs for the reality of original sin, is we just look at, e even in our own lives, we can maybe see some of our... our Maybe the mistakes that our grandfathers or parents or, you know, and maybe we can see in our own lives that there's kind of a wound that happens and it gets carried over in some sort of way. Um, maybe in our difficulty or maybe our parents' difficulty of being able to show us that deep love that we were, that we were called to because we're not free ourselves. And so there's this kind of wounding that happens there and ultimately... Christ comes to come into that to heal the family tree all the way back to Adam himself. And so that's where the great hope is. So you don't want to feel down and, and depressed and say everything's hopeless, but it's also important to recognize that hurt people hurt people. And so we have Adam and Eve who got hurt in their own relationship. They, in a sense, you know, had a broken marriage that still found reconciliation. I mean, they, they ultimately found themselves in Hades. Jesus went and searched for them on Holy Saturday, brought them up to heaven. And so there's always that hope there. But remember how they turned on one another, saying, well, God, it really wasn't my fault. It was the woman. She did it. And this sense of, like, disharmony and many times what happens in life when there's that disharmony is that sense of competitiveness where there's something unhealthy and it, there's this competitiveness can sometimes get carried over in the midst of the way our children experience unconditional love or conditional love and this is maybe one of those situations in which Cain and Abel start to experience this well, Abel doesn't, but Cain starts to experience this competitiveness, the sense of 
of getting resentful because God is looking with favor on Abel's offering and not on his. Now there is a part that he has to play in it. Remember that that's also some of the the, the lie sometimes in our culture is there really isn't anything that I need to owe, owe up to because it's really everyone else that made me do this. So there's that balance of, yes, there is this reality around us that really does influence us and, and really brings some of that brokenness in there. But ultimately, it does come down to we are a free human person that is called to choose the good and avoid evil. And Cain, his first choosing of evil was not to give the Lord what was his due. Justice is to give the other person what's owed to them, to honor the relationship. And the relationship that they had, that, that all of them had with God was that he's their creator and they should give him the first fruits. This sacrifice of praise, being able to not give the leftovers, but to say, I want to give you what's most precious in my heart. And Cain wanted to kind of go around that. And it says that he would offer, he brought an offering to the Lord from the fruit of the soil, while Abel brought one of the best firstlings of his flock. So because there's a difference in that description there, what it's saying is Cain just kind of found whatever's around. He kind of got the leftovers. You know, he, he got the harvest for himself and he's like, okay, well, there's a couple corn stalks over there. Here you go, Lord. You know, and, and that's something we need to be aware of because how many times do we give God the leftovers? You know, in, in various aspects. I mean, the whole time, talent, treasure aspect, but just even our heart, that reality of how much energy do we put in the things that we, that we love, our passions. But then it's like, God, I don't really have time for you. I know that you're important, but we kind of leave him to the very end of the day and we're exhausted and we're just sort of like, thank you, God, instead of really starting with him first. And something actually that I'm going to be doing during this Lent, um, another friend of mine in the parish is going to be doing this, is that we have, um, we have our phone set for every single hour from 9 o'clock until 8 o'clock at night. On the hour, an alarm is going to go off. It's not going to play music or anything. It's going to just vibrate. And it's just going to say, praise. And what I'm going to enter into, because I can struggle with this. I go through the day, and at the very end of the day, it's like, oh yeah, Lord, I forgot to make you present in my life, to really be aware of your presence, just because I'm like, you know, sort of running through the day. So this becomes a moment to be able to stop, be reminded to praise God, and to offer him, as the responsorial psalm says, the first of the hour. To just take one or two minutes and say, praise and thank you, Jesus. Whatever's going on, if there's, it, it makes us aware of what's the blessing that happened in the last hour. And already there's things where there's conversations that happen. There's, there's moments of grace where I'm aware of it. Whereas before, I just kind of went through the day and forgot about it. And many times didn't even remember it because it passed. And I wasn't aware and I didn't thank the Lord in that moment. So this, is, this might be something you might be interested in, is just set your, the smartphones are really easy with this. You set it, I mean, I'm not doing it like in the middle of the night because I need to be able to sleep, but during my waking hours to be able to have that sacrifice of praise, that's what Abel's doing. He's taking the first of his flock. He doesn't wait and say, well, there's a, and, and this is where in the Bible it talks about, don't bring a lame animal, don't bring a blotched animal, but bring the perfect lamb. And isn't that what Jesus did? Isn't that what the Father did for us? Is he didn't just give us leftovers, but he said, I'm going to give you that which is most precious. I'm going to give you my only son, my beloved son, the one that I love. That's the same description that Abraham was called to give his son Isaac. And ultimately, he didn't offer in that way of sacrifice but that became the sign of what the Father did for us. 
And Jesus fully accepting that and fully saying, I want this for my people. So that's something to think about in these times is don't be like Cain in this moment. Don't give the leftovers. Because God wants the heart and he wants the first fruits there. But now notice, Cain sees that Abel is being blessed and he's not. That resentment starts to come in, that brokenness, that comparing, versus being able to hear what the Lord was saying in that, to say, Cain, you're just giving the leftover right now. I want your heart. I want this relationship with you. And Cain is blinded by the comparison. Don't we get blinded sometimes when we just fall into that, that envy or jealousy, and we can't really see what God is wanting us to do to be able to grow. And we're not able to see the deep love that he has for us because we see, well, God seems to love him more. And we don't realize, well, God loves us and he's calling us to that deeper relationship. But when we give the leftovers, we block God's love. And then the serpent twists that and says, well, it's actually God that doesn't love you. And yet God is pouring out his love, but we're kind of putting blinders up and then we blame it on God. And we say, well, well, actually it's your fault that I'm not being loved. God never changes. He loves us 100% always. It's actually us that put the blinders up and then we blame God, just like Adam did ultimately to God when he said, well, it was your fault that this woman that you put in the garden, she's the one who did it. Do you see how that dynamic goes there? This word resentment as well, it's a very interesting one in Spanish. Resentimiento means to feel again and again and again. And it's that experience of the enemy wants us to keep feeling this pain of I am loved less than this person or this person is better than me. And it's this cycle that goes over and over and over until finally that, that pain of that memory so it's the wrong kind of memory that we need to hold on to. It's the memory that the enemy wants to put to say, you are worthless. You have lesser value. God loves you less. And little by little, that starts then to move us to maybe greater sins. Because we start believing that lie. And we don't realize that it's actually the Lord calling us to step more deeper into the light, we start pulling back and then other sins come. And in Cain's situation, so much so that he's willing to kill his brother because he can't stand that pain over and over again that becomes the lie that he buys into. And yet God himself is even saying, Cain, it says here, it says, if you do well, you can hold up your head. In other words, you're, you're blocking my love from you. Give me your heart. He says there's a demon lurking at your door. That enemy, the sin of resentment, the sin of unforgiveness, the sense of he's at the door reminding us, knocking at the door over and over again saying, feel this, feel this, feel this, feel this. This urge is towards you, this demon, wanting to just keep pulling us down, but it says, yet you can be his master. And that's the grace that we have in Christ, to be able to renounce that demon, that lie. The lie of not being loved by God. And to say the truth is that God died for me. And Satan is just putting this web Isaiah talks about the web of death that covers all people, the sort of web that blackens everything, and we get stuck, and we aren't able to see the full picture. That's when sin happens, is when we can't see the whole picture of how God is loving us and how God is Father to us. And the narrow blinders go on, and all we see is what the enemy wants us to see. And yet the Lord is saying here, Cain, 
you always have a way out. You always can be able to say to that temptation, in the name of the Lord, you are not welcome here. And we know as Christians, the name of Jesus is powerful. And very sadly, Cain does not listen to this because the very next verse is, Cain said to his brother, let's go out in the field. And there's, between those verses, something happens in Cain's heart. The Lord is trying to say, don't listen to this knocking at the door. Don't open this door because it's going to lead you into a horrible direction. And then there's a pause. And then all of a sudden it says, Cain says to Abel, come. You could just feel that sadness of the Lord knowing what's just about to happen. And it started because he believed the lie that he was not loved by God. Let's ask the Lord for that grace to be able to recognize where is the enemy knocking at our door? Where is he creating that experience of resentimiento? To feel again, but to feel again the false truth. Instead of feeling again the truth that we are loved, that God has a great plan for us. And even in those moments in which we start covering over that God loves us and he's saying, let go of these things and know that I love you with the same dignity as your brother over here. But give me your heart because it's only then where you can feel and experience the full power of how I love you. Let's ask the Lord for this grace today.